What types of data analysis does streaming music provide that downloads don't? At my company, Audigent, we practice what's called stream science. So we, uh, with stream science, what we're talking about is extracting behavioral analytics from uh, watching people streaming activity on music services like Spotify or Pandora or even YouTube. Um, the, the challenge with uh, downloads is you lose a lot of visibility over what happens with the consumer after they buy the song. Uh, but with streaming activity, you can see, you know, end to end, you can see when they list, start playing the song, you can see when they stop, you can see when they share it, you can see which artists they listen to repeatedly. Uh, so it becomes a really rich environment to kind of study consumer activity around music. So significantly more visibility than what we've traditionally yeah, seen. Yes, significantly uh, much more data, much more visibility over how people are enjoying the, the content that they uh, uh, stream. So related to that, you were involved in a research project that applied data science to two years of the top 10,000 uh, music releases. What was the most surprising thing you learned from that process? So we have a data partnership with Nielsen, um, who collects Nielsen, uh, collects music data from uh, the entire industry. And so what's really exciting about that is it gave us access to all these songs. So the top 10,000 releases over the past two years, which roughly translates to the top 1,000 artists in the music industry. And what we found when looking at that data were a couple of key insights. So one is what we call the fan coefficient. Uh, and essentially that is a principle that we borrowed from publishing where uh, someone uh, a while ago figured out what makes content go viral and we uh, borrowed some of uh, those methods and some of those uh, statistics and we applied them to music to see what are the the what's the analogy to a song going viral or a song becoming a hit mm -hmm. or uh, popular and what we found is is essentially about a thousand to one impression so a thousand impressions yield one fan um, what we call an active fan so someone who's likely to cons continue consuming this artist uh, what that's really useful for for the industry is you can start to use these metrics to anticipate uh, the performance of a song when it's released. So if you are above this threshold of a thousand to one, you know that you're, you're onto something, you're probably generating a hit. If you're below it, you know you need to spin more, you know you need to run more advertising, or maybe the song's just not resonating with the public. But those types of, of levers to pull are really valuable to, to the music industry and also to, um, uh, to brands who want to piggyback off the success of a music artist. Sure, sure. Are, are music labels applying that kind of information yet? Uh, so increasingly so. Um, it's still, I, I would say, even though the data revolution has happened everywhere else in the music world, <laughs> it's a little bit behind. Sure. Uh, uh, I, I think that what is uh, making it a necessity is the fact that we live in a world where data is abundant and it is uh, not really smart anymore not to leverage that abundance. You know, for a while it was too expensive or it was too unpredictable or it was too unreliable for music uh, companies to rely on data. But now it's become so cheap and so repeatable and so uh, uh, abundant that it, it's, it's, be, it's screaming at them sure. to, to leverage it. And we're one of the companies that can help them do that. I imagine in time it will become sort of a default mode, right? We like to think so. Sure, sure. How do you see access to this kind of data shaping the relationship between artists and labels and listeners? So uh, I think it's really critical to the future of the music industry to leverage this uh, uh, data abundant environment. I think it gives them access to uh, learning more about the people who are consuming uh, the, the artists, the audiences who are following the artists. It also gives the artists a uh, visibility into their fans. They can relate to them, they can interact with them uh, on social channels or, or uh, in person. Uh, the other thing that it opens up the door for, uh, and one of the things that our company has brought to the table, is new revenue streams for the music industry. You know, music as a commodity isn't what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Practically no one wants to buy music, you know, maybe on vinyl, uh, sure. but people want to consume music. They don't necessarily want to spend money to own it. Um, they uh, stream it, they uh, share it with friends, but they don't necessarily buy physical albums anymore. And so what we open up the door for, and what we try to help others open up the door for, is to commoditize the data around music, the audience data around music, as opposed to just the music itself. Interesting. Uh, last question for you, what people or projects are you following these days? Well, we're pretty uh, excited about some of the other music data companies that are out there. We were really big fans of Next Big Sound before they got acquired by Pandora, uh, and then companies like Cobalt Music and uh, uh, Buzz Angle. 
are companies that were, you know, they're in a similar space. So it's exciting to see what steps they're taking that we aren't, and also where the path may go for the future and how it fits into our uh, plans. Great. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks. thanks.